Lawrence Snow here and welcome back to highintensitybusiness.com. This is episode 314 and today's guest is Dave Smith, PhD. Dave is a chartered psychologist and a healthcare and professions council registered sport and exercise psychologist. He is currently senior lecturer in sport and exercise psychology at Manchester Metropolitan University and associate editor of the Sport Psychologist, which is one of the most prominent peer-reviewed sports psychology journals. His research interests include psychological issues in bodybuilding and strength training, psychological skills training, particularly imagery, lower back pain. He is a former personal trainer with a specific interest in high-intensity training and also has interests in target and precision sports and thought and decision-making processes in sports and other contexts. Dave returns to join me for a part three of our decision-making series, a series that shows you how to make better decisions in your business and life. Dave, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much for having me, Lawrence. I've been really looking forward to it. Likewise, um, really appreciate you taking the time. And it's it's obviously taken us a long time to get this scheduled and a lot of tumultuous um, you know, challenges and uh, and and periods over the last sort of 12 months or so for, for both of us. And so it's great to finally sit down and do this. <laughs> yeah, so, very much so. So we we obviously covered a, a fair amount in parts one and two for this decision-making series. And there's certainly be the links to those podcast in the show notes for, for this over at episode 314 on highintensitybusiness.com. Um, but in this, we're going we're to start covering some of the other elements that we haven't quite got to yet in terms of um, you know, other, other things we need to think about, mental models when making decisions. And then obviously, uh, probably in our next podcast together, we'll, we'll round it off and, and, and complete the series with some content on bias awareness algorithms and pre-mortems. Um, so let's, let's kick off with skill and luck. Understanding the importance of skill and luck. Where do we go from here, Dave? Well, it's, it's, this is, is huge for me because our success in life is arguably shaped really by only two things, skill and luck. Yeah, They shape our reality. And yet the problem is that people find it very difficult to distinguish between them. They can be very hard to to untangle. So, for example, in one of the previous podcasts, I gave the example of uh, Gary Kildall and Bill Gates, a very early um, uh, computer developers who obviously Bill Gates, tremendously successful. Gary Kildall was was very, very unfortunate. He was you know, almost a you know a textbook example of of bad luck, and it's interesting that Bill Gates will tell you himself. He he concedes that luck played an immense role in him getting to where he is today. But the problem is, when you start talking about this, some people really object to it, and they say, "Well, hang on, you know, you're saying that uh, success is really all about luck," and that's that's not what I'm saying. Uh, it's a it's an objection Nassim Taleb got a lot after he wrote the book Fooled by Randomness. People would say the same to him. Ah, you're saying everything's random and uh, it's not all about skill. And, and Taleb argued, and I'm going to argue, that that's not what we're saying. But what we are saying is that luck is more important than people think. Not that it's everything, just that if we really want to understand why we've been successful or unsuccessful in our business or in other situations, it's really important to be able to untangle the the impact that that skill and luck can have because people aren't always very good at it. And if you're really self-aware and can do that, that's potentially a big big business advantage. Um, So I'll give you a a great example. It comes from uh, Michael Mobison. When he uh, he started his career, he wasn't sure what he wanted to do when he left college. Uh, he went for a, a, a job interview with an investment bank. I think it was like a trainee scheme. And this was a really rigorous thing. They had something like six different interviews in a day with different people at this investment bank. And, um, you know, it was a really, uh, you know, really tough process. And um, so they had five different interviews, and then one final one, which was with the main boss, I think the the chairman of the company, okay? 
So Michael's thinking to himself as the day went on, I've done okay here, but he wasn't sure, you know. Mm. Goes into the the interview with uh, with the main man, and he notices straight away that this guy's got a like waste paper basket with a Washington Redskins logo on. Now, Michael was a big Washington fan, had been all his life. <laughs> so he spots this and says to the guy, hey, you're a Redskins fan? He's like, yeah, yeah. And it turns out, like, like a lot of people would be in the UK with soccer. These guys are both, you know, obsessed with, with football, you know. And so the boss then chats to him about football for like half an hour. <laughs> and then he says, ah, oh, we got to wrap up now. The interview's done. And Michael's thinking, hang on, we, we haven't even talked about anything to do with the job, you know. And he was really surprised. He was like, that's a bit strange. But he, he went off. And then he got a call saying, great, you've, you've got, a, got a position here, okay? And he thought, well, that's, that's all fine. He started this, this job at this company about six months or so in. His line manager takes him to one side and he says, Michael, he says, um, there's something we really need to talk about. And Michael's like worried, you know, he's like, oh, no, well, what's this? What's the problem? And the guy saw he looked concerned. He said, don't worry, it's, it's not a problem. But he said, it's something I've been dying to tell you, and I think you should know. He said, you've done really well with us, really pleased with how it's going. But he said, I think you should know that when you had your initial interviews here, most of the people that interviewed you didn't think you should get the job. They turned you down. And Michael was like a bit surprised. And he's like, why are you telling me this? And he said, well, it's the strangest thing, he said, because most people – didn't think you came across that well in interview, but the boss, he overruled everybody and he said, no, this guy's amazing. We've got to have him. He's just great. And, and he was so adamant that you had what it took that we, we couldn't say no. And yet, as Michael will tell you, what they didn't even talk about business. You know, all they did was talk about football. Now, the point is he's gone on to have you know, an amazing, amazing career as, you know, as a fund manager, investment professional, as, as a professor as well, um, you know, written some amazing books and, and had a great life. And, and he'll, he'll laugh and he'll tell you himself that his career was basically launched by, you know, um, a waste paper bin. Yeah. And if he hadn't been in that position at that time, if the guy hadn't had Washington Redskins on the bin, or if he, you know, if he supported some other team, who knows? He might not have got that opportunity. But could he? Couldn't he have? Um, like, you know, it, it, it's probably in, in my mind. There's more to it than just the fact that they have a shared fondness of this team. I mean, it, it, uh, it, the, the important thing here is how, how did that conversation go? Because I don't know. Maybe, maybe uh, Michael is name, isn't it? Um, yeah maybe he had just really good rapport building skills, right? And he just built rapport and maybe he could have done that other way. So what, So what's to say there's not an element of skill there as well in the ability to build rapport and a common interest, which one can do, you know, I, I appreciate it's lucky having the Washington Redskins team logo on the bin, but, you know, maybe they can bond over something else, which is pers personally in my case, for instance, in interviews I've had that have been successful, usually once you've been talking for a while, you find a common interest and you bond over that, right? So for example, yeah. when I uh, went for my interview, my last job, um, before I, which I, which I left about four years ago to move to Ireland, um, I had a pretty successful career there in technology sales. And the, um, my boss hired me uh, on, a, on a, probably a few, uh, on a few things, but one of the things we really, really bonded over was um, Tim Ferriss's book, The Four Hour Work Week, and just reading nonfiction for self improvement in general. And so I obviously really capitalized on that and made sure that he realized I found that was really important. Um, and so, anyway, sorry, it's a long way of me saying that. What's the, how can you completely untangle uh, skill from that or, or, or put, put that? experience completely down to luck i don't think you can well this is a really interesting point um you possibly can't although clearly there was a lot of luck involved in mm. that opportunity presenting itself which i think is the point michael makes when he is making when he tells that story mm. um but actually a lot of people will say that 
there's there's a kind of really common thing in the culture in our culture where people will say things like you make your own luck or luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity <laughs> uh, or there's the famous one when Gary Player for example uh, I believe uh, the, the famous golfer I think he chipped a, he, he, he chipped in from off the green it may even have been a bunker shot and somebody in the crowd said oh you were lucky there Gary and he said, yeah, you know, and it's funny because the more I practice, the luckier I get. Um, but the point is that these kind of sayings kind of miss the point because they don't address what's really happening. So if you're if you prepare well, that's not luck. Yeah. If you practice mm. really hard and therefore increase your percentage of, you know, high quality bunker shots, that's not luck. But where the luck occurs is where, uh, and I'll define luck here, I think it's really important to define what we're, we're yeah. talking about, is luck is a chance occurrence that is outside an individual's control. So essentially, um, if another outcome is possible from something, luck is involved in some way, but it's out of control and it's un- out of our control and it's unpredictable. Whereas skill, uh, you know, a simple dictionary definition would be something like the ability to use our knowledge effectively to execute a task. So, for example, in that case, like we're talking about Michael, it may well be that he's that he's had great interpersonal skills. Of course, he's he's far too you know modest to, to say, but maybe he had really good interpersonal skills that enabled him to take advantage of this situation. But the luck is in the situation happening in uh, in the first place. They, so they can so, combine is what you're saying. The situation can combine absolutely. the two. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's yeah, exactly. So both are really important in in success. Um to know where the skill really plays a role in an outcome, one thing you want to ask yourself is whether you can lose on purpose. So for example, if we are playing tennis, okay, I could I could pretty much lose uh, even not on purpose no matter how hard I tried because I probably wouldn't be very good but if I was a good player I could still lose on purpose by deliberately hitting the ball into the net or over the tram lines for instance Mm -hmm. but even in something where luck is possibly more important like poker there's still a lot of skill involved and you could lose a poker game on purpose by making deliberately really bad decisions by uh, holding when clearly you should be folding and vice versa. But on the other hand, if you look at something that is pure luck, like uh, doing a lottery, for instance, you can't lose that or win on on purpose. It's Mm. it's not in your control. So understanding those categories, I think, can be quite helpful. But people find it really hard. and, And I think that partly links... So the the narrative fallacy that we've we've talked about before, uh, there's a couple. Of, there's a great study uh, of Spanish lottery winners where researchers interviewed both people who'd won the Spanish lottery and other Spa- members of the Spanish public who hadn't won the lottery, and they asked them um, what they thought of the financial acumen of lottery winners. And they are, and people on average thought that lottery winners had better financial knowledge and skills than people who weren't lottery winners. And of course, <laughs> the thing about winning the lottery is it is purely by chance. But people find it a very, very reluctant to accept the role of, of luck in life. And um, there was another great example from the Spanish lottery, actually. Um, a guy um, won who won the Spanish lottery in the the mid-1970s, he had picked the number uh, 48, and it had won the big jackpot. And he said, uh, when he was interviewed by the media, you know, they said, oh, 48 must be your lucky number. And he said, luck's got nothing to do with it, he said. I knew this was going to win. And they said, well, how did you know? He said, well, before I bought the lottery ticket, for seven nights in a row, I dreamed of the number seven. And because seven sevens are 48, <laughs> I knew that that was the number to pick. Aren't seven sevens 49? 
Yeah, they are. They are 49. Oh. That's, that's the point. But we can <laughs> get the number right. And he seriously oh, believed that that was the reason he won the lottery. So, so people are really find it hard to accept the role of luck in life. Oh, and how many people are like that, though, Dave? Like, are we, we're talking about a certain cohort of the population, right? <laughs> well, we, we are indeed, and that's an extreme <laughs> example. And it's a, I give it just because it's a humorous example. Yeah, sure, but, sure. but the research does show that people find it very, very hard to rationalize luck. And the reason for that, it relates to another cognitive bias known as the just world fallacy, where people think that life outcomes are inherently fair. So that, that's reflected in things people say like, everything happens for a reason, or so-and-so got what was coming to him, you know, and it suggests that life outcomes are all kind of deserved because they're all about talent and skill. And, and that makes it easier to justify the inherent kind of unfairness in, in life's lottery, if you like. But we all know on some level that bad things can happen to good people. And, and of course, good things can, can happen to bad people. And that's because in most human endeavors, results are actually about a mix of, of skill and luck. You know, So for example, if, if I'm uh, uh, playing a pool match, I could play brilliantly and still lose because of a bad run of the balls, which is like an unforeseeable set of consequences that can happen despite making very high quality shots. So, you know, that can happen. Um, and it's, it's why Danny Kahneman, who we've talked about before, when he was asked from, for, from all his research on uh, the psychology of, you know, human performance, what did he have a formula for success? And, and he said, yeah, he said, the most important thing I've learned from all my research is that is this simple formula. He said, some success equals some skills plus some luck, and massive success equals a little more skill and a lot of luck. So, you know, so this idea that we have to be comfortable with, with understanding, you know, what we can control and what we can't, and, and how these things might, might contribute. And the other thing here that is, I think for a lot of people really counterintuitive is something that uh, it actually originates uh, uh, with uh, Stephen Jay Gould, who who studied this in basketball. Uh, I think in the uh, in the nineteen nineties, and uh, no, sorry, baseball. Um, but Michael Nobison's kind of taken that work further, and he's he's named this thing the paradox of skill, and it's very counterintuitive. But basically what researchers have found, and there's a really good study on this in, in golf uh, published just last year, is that luck actually plays a more important role at a higher level of performance than a lower level. So if you look at professional performers, say professional golfers, um, the um, difference between competitors is really small. But at a lower level, the, le the more heterogeneous, the differences are, are much greater, okay? So, for example, if Roger Federer plays Rafael Nadal at tennis, they're so good that their standards are very similar. The standard mm. deviation would be, would be very low. So luck, on a one-to-one -one match basis, will play a role. But if I play Roger Federer, there's going to be no luck about it. He's going <laughs> to win every time. Because he's far more skilled, but but imagine Fed even if you have an intense amount of luck, you'll still lose. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. That won't make a difference. So so for example, imagine Pedra's playing Nadal in a big final, okay? And the night before the final, Pedra's sleeping in his hotel. It's three a.m. and the fire alarm goes off, and he's got to go downstairs in his pajamas, and he's locked out the hotel for an hour, and then has to go back in, and he might struggle to get. Uh, back to sleep. So the next day, he's a little bit tired, a little less fresh than Nadal. That can make all the difference. But if that happened to Nadal or Fedra and they're playing me, that's not going to make any difference. They're still going, um, you know, going to win. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, 
<coughs> that's very well demonstrated, and as I say, empirically, has been shown, uh, you know, to be the place uh, to be the case in, in sports like golf. But the interesting thing is, very few commentators talk about this as a, a reason for for winning. Uh, or losing, but there's a real nice practical takeaway from all of this this area, which is once we understand about how luck interacts with skill differential, then that tells us that if we want to be really successful, for example, in our business, yeah, what we should really do is focus on areas where the skill differential is great, and that means luck plays much less of a role. Um, so for, I'll give you a, a great example of that is Annie Duke, the ex-pro poker player, who, again, I think we've, we've mentioned in, in previous podcasts. Um, so when, uh, when she was uh, playing professional poker, she attracted a bit of criticism. And in fact, people thought she was mad because she had a strategy where she would deliberately avoid high stake. If she was at a tournament and there was one table where there were high stakes games going on and another table where there were low stakes games going on, she would ignore the high stakes game and focus on the low stakes. And people would say, that doesn't make any sense. You can win a lot more money, the high stakes table. But the point was, the very best players would be playing at the high stakes table. The poorer players would gravitate to the low stakes table where she knew she could consistently win. So she took advantage of that differential and it made her one of the most successful um, female poker players in history. Wow. But then when she was pitted up against the better players on the um, high stakes table, wouldn't she then not be so, not her win ratio would be much lower? It would be lower, but she would make a lot of money on the low stakes tables. Right. But she would still be able to perform well in the high stakes table. It's just that she recognized that luck was going to play okay. more of a role if she consistently spent all the time at the high stakes table. And to her, that was an unacceptable risk. So let's just, no, that's a great example. So let's bring this into the sort of a, a business context. You mentioned there about focusing more on, is it skill differentials or areas where it makes more sense to focus on skill? Could you expand on that in the, in the context of a, a business? I don't know. Yeah. If, yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, I can give you an example. One that springs to mind with, with me is, is is a business like Kiza Training, for instance, that most of your listeners are, are well familiar with. Yeah, mm. They've made a very, very successful business out of focusing on their area of, of strength, which is to attract sort of people from the general population who aren't normally exercisers, often people with orthopedic issues, um, to mm. get into resistance training. Now, if they had focused, if they had tried to focus on, for example, um, bodybuilders, where they would have been competing with hardcore gyms and with full of mirrors and music, and they would have found that very difficult. Um, they would have found that a lot harder to. They would have found it a lot harder to compete with that market. Instead, what they've done is they've realised that that. Um, the kind of methods that, for example, Arthur Jones exposed and the kind of kit that they've got is stuff that actually appeals quite well to ordinary, I'd say ordinary in inverted commas people, rather than real serious athletes or bodybuilders, although obviously they get some of those in as, as well. Mm -hmm. But the point is they've focused on the thing that they know and they do really well, and the other people don't do. I mean, how many gym chains uh, really get people see in who are sedentary and get them really serious about resistance training? Certainly not middle-aged and older people, which again is their target market. They've focused very much on, on that, and that's made them very successful. But equally, they've shied away from markets where that probably won't work so well, you know, like the US and they've tried a little bit in the UK and they, that, that didn't work so, so well. Um, what a wonderful example. I love that example because just to, just to expand on what you said there, 
you know, if they, if, if one starts a personal training business and goes after, you know, um, or has a, has a, no strategic niche, right? So in other words, they just, yeah. Hey, we're a health and fitness business. Come and work out of us. Um, and they don't target anyone specific, right? So trying to sell to everyone, you are, you are then, if I've understood this right, you are completely dependent or not completely dependent, but you're very much more dependent on getting lucky, right? In order to successfully compete with the competition. And we all know that health and fitness and the gym business, which obviously has been a bit rocky over the last 12 months and certainly been impacted by recent events, um, is incredibly competitive. So good luck with that. Whereas your example, keys are training, and I can think of obviously a fair few more examples, um, have a strategic niche, right? They just focus yeah. on supervised strength training, right? Using medical equipment, using medics. Um, and they target very specific people. They have a very specific target market in the way of a demographic and people with orthopedic issues and people rehabbing from injuries. Um, and so by just being so targeted, so you can call that strategic niche and having a target market is they are, they've have an enormous advantage on the skill aspect and less reliant on getting lucky. Is that a fair summary? That's exactly right. Exactly. Okay. Um, so, so there are some really nice, uh, potential takeaways from from the, this idea for you know personal trainers and uh, and gym owners very very much so. Um, I, I think the the other thing to to bear in mind here you know is is the importance of understanding that in the uh, in the short term you know luck can often determine uh, how well our business goes. So for example, obviously in the last year, you know, you mentioned uh, yes. COVID, for example, you know, that's something that was probably not realistically foreseeable, certainly not in the form that it happened and to the extent that it happened. And, um, you know, so in the long, in the short term, that could potentially be pretty disastrous for somebody setting up a, a gym, for example, if you're in a country where gyms are, are closed for a, a large part of, of the year. But that happens in a lot of, you know, a lot of situations where short term things might not go well. But that doesn't necessarily tell us anything about what could happen in, in the long term. So for example, you know, there are there are plenty of examples in sport of you know elite performers underperforming for a period of time for sometimes for reasons sometimes for reasons that aren't aren't apparent at all and and then uh they will perform better later on so for example uh, uh another one uh that michael mobistin talks about a bit is uh the famous new york yankees example in the mid 2000s where they started a season really poorly they lost a lot of games the team's owner and manager were very critical of the players and um commentators then um, kind of noted this and there was a big improvement then in the team's performance and they ended up finishing the season joint first and a lot of commentators attributed that improvement in performance to the tongue lashing that was meted out by the manager but in reality the reason for the change actually is, is impossible to pinpoint but something happens that's really important here I think for all of us to bear in mind that can happen in sport, it happens in investing, it happens in business, it happens with basically with anything in life where we have skill and luck, and that is reversion to the mean. And that's a really important phenomenon that a lot of people misunderstand and, and misinterpret. So the, the, one of the most famous examples was actually the, the guy that discovered it, Sir Francis Galton, who was a famous Victorian scientist. And he did some research in the 1880s where he first discovered this with uh, with plants, with sweet peas. And then he discovered it worked with human height. And basically what happened was he found that parents who were a lot taller than the average person in the population also had children who were a lot taller, but the children didn't tend to be as tall as the parents. And it was also the same with people who were significantly shorter than average. They would have children who were shorter, but they would be taller than the parents. And so basically, Thank God for that. Um, he, he, he referred <laughs> to that as, as mean reversion. So the idea that over time, 
when you have a system with variation in it, values tend to return to the mean over time. And that's really important for things like business, investing, and sport, where outcomes are a mix of skill and luck, because they tend to revert to the mean over time as luck is random and it tends to even out. So, so Galton was interested in the variability of kind of genetic inheritance, but actually we can see in any system where there's a certain amount of um, variability. That's fascinating. Would you be able to just give maybe one or two more examples in business for that, just so I can understand that better? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've got this probably, uh, there's a, a couple of good sporting ones as well sure. that probably might might help also uh, as some of my favorites. You may have heard of this one. Um, I don't know if you've heard of the, what they call the Sports Illustrated Curse. I've and, heard of that. Right. Well, it's Sports Illustrated, obviously, is probably the world's most famous sporting magazine. And it's a big honor. Only the very, very top elite athletes in any sport ever get on the front cover of Sports Illustrated. Okay. But people are often reluctant to actually be on the front cover because of this thing called the Sports Illustrated curse, which basically (laughs) is. That if you go on the cover afterwards, your performance is never as good as it was before you went on the cover. Mm-hmm. And people actually, you know, athletes are a really superstitious lot. And they really believe that this is some kind of weird curse. Actually, it's simply mean reversion in action. Because if you've done something so good to get you onto the cover of Sports Illustrated, that's probably pretty much the top thing you're probably going to do in your career. So the only way from that point is down. And people don't see that. And, you know, it's, it happens in all sports. There's a great one in, uh, in snooker. Uh, for, your, for your American uh, listeners, snooker is basically like pool and billiards, but it's played on a, a bigger table. Um, and every year in England, they have the World Snooker Championships at a, a theatre called the Crucible. And there you have what they call the Crucible Curse. And that basically is that when somebody wins their first world title in snooker, they almost always perform poorly at the same tournament the following year and lose in the early round. Now, again, the point here is that what's actually happening is is simple mean reversion. If you win the world title, that is the best achievement you're ever going to do. And for many of these people, it's the only time they'll ever do it. And they're certainly not going to do it every year. So the chance of doing it two years in a row, it's like, you know, it's like a golfer. If they score a round of 60, they're not going to score a round of 60 in the next round in the tournament, yeah? Mm-hmm. So the, so what happens with the snooker player, they perform, they lose in the first round or the second round the next season, and everyone says, hey, that's the crucible curse again. What's actually happening is that because their performance the year before was so far away from their long-term average, the next year the performance is going to be closer to that. Mm-hmm which takes them back towards the mean. And people don't understand that. And it's the same with businesses. Again, with investing, if you look at stock prices, okay, people jump onto the back of stock prices going up. They see a company shooting up there, way, this is great, this is easy money, I'm going to put my money into stock X, okay? But the problem with that is what eventually happens is the stock stocks tend to the stock market displays mean reversion over time, okay? And chances are, if a stock's gone up so high, there's only one way it's then going to go, and that's down. And a lot of retail investors, you know, it's been shown a, a very, very prone to this. So, And it's why professional investors often refer to retail money as, as dumb money, because what they'll do is they'll say, hey, this is great. This stock's gone up. They put money in it. It mean reverts and they lose money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, but it's also true of any business that you know you have to be very very cautious and realize that mean reversion will profits mean revert over time. Again, there's there's a lot of evidence in the the academic finance world showing that profits tend to be mean reverting. 
So in other words, if you have an incredible month or incredible quarter, you have to bear in mind that that will revert to the mean at some point. Uh, maybe the following quarter, you'll have a much, you'll have a, you have a poor quarter, which will then average out over the long term. And you have to kind of keep that in mind. Is that, is that kind yeah, of what you're saying? That is exactly what I'm saying. We have to bear that in mind because in any business, the outcomes that you have will be a, a mix of skill and luck. And the luck will even out over time, but the skill uh, won't necessarily. Mm. And we have to therefore avoid drawing conclusions from short-term outcomes. And instead, we right. should always focus, and, and this is something I'll talk about in, in more detail later, uh, but we should always focus on the process, not on the outcome, because um, oh, the yeah. outcome can be affected by luck. But if we have the right process, that's applying our skill in the, the optimum way. That's so profound, that last bit. Um, so it's so... So if I've understood this right, it's like, well, yes, okay, that exceptional performance, that quarter or that, you know, that half year, a certain element of that was skill and a certain element of that was luck, but you probably don't know the ratio. It's probably impossible to pinpoint that. Yeah, um, pretty and, much, yeah. And so you have to almost take the outcome with a pinch of salt to an extent and realize that, Although it's it's difficult, is it? It's hard. How do you untangle the two when you're looking back retrospectively as a business? Because it's quite easy to draw cause and effect, or it's easy for one to it try is, and draw uh, cause and effect from actions and profit, right? It's very yeah. It's so <laughs> hard to stop yourself doing that. And uh, you know, I see that. You know, when I'm working, you know, in my case with sport performers, that's one of the things that I'm I really try to do is to get them to out of that mindset and to focus instead, understand that they can't always untangle that easily in the short run. So, for example, if you have a run of poor outcomes, it doesn't always mean that you're doing anything wrong. Or if you have a run of good outcomes, it doesn't mean you're a business genius. What will happen is the game will play out and you'll find that out only in the very long term. I think... I think this is this is fascinating. So I think the the question I'm coming to thinking about all of what you're saying is how do you know what to focus on then? How do you know what are the skills you really need to hone and what's really going to make the difference if you can't really measure it based on the outcome very clearly, right? So how does okay. one figure that out? It's a big one. And I think again <laughs> the key for yeah, it's it's huge. The key here for me is figuring out what uh, the the correct processes and focusing on that process. Mm -hmm. And regardless of whether it seems to be working out or not, if you have confidence in the process, then you keep applying that process again and, and again and again. And, and that's really important to do. So one way of helping with that, for instance, is ensuring that, you know, if you're working with a business, that you make sure that feedback is focused on this purely on elements of skill and ignores things that that can happen due due to luck mm. or, or pure mean reversion so having having a good feedback process is is really important Danny Kahneman had a great example of this early in his career he used to he did some work with the Israeli military and he was working with fighter pilots and instructors and he was trying to get the instructors to be really positive and constructive in their feedback. And the, the, the instructors were really, really um, resistant to this. And they said to him, they said, look, sir, we know you've got all this psychology knowledge and everything. But what you're saying is for the birds. We know it just doesn't work because we know that when we're really nice to pilots and we congratulate them when they've had a great test flight, the next flight, they almost always do worse. So it's like they don't try as hard because they think they can do it. And then if they do badly and we give them a real tongue lashing, they always do better the next time. And of course, Kahneman knew what was happening here was simple mean reversion. That if you have a nightmare one day, you'll probably do better the next because mm -hmm. you go back towards your, your long-term mean and vice versa. Um, but what the instructors did was they were um, conflating um, the uh, the skill element with with mean reversion. 
So, you know, that's one way. The other thing is to be really careful about sample size. So the more luck contributes to an outcome, the bigger the sample size we need to distinguish between skill and luck. So in a one-off football match, the worst team can win due to luck. But over a season, the better team will win. Okay, so uh-huh. consider sample size, consider how much data you really have and avoid extrapolating single pieces of data, single events to telling you some massive narrative about the success or otherwise of your business. You have to do it over time and you have to make sure that you have enough data to make a realistic appraisal about what you're doing that last point is so key and i think it's so such a common mistake where it's it's like um is it is it kind of like narrative fallacy right where someone looks back on what they did in their business they say oh yeah well i achieved this result because of all this all this stuff i did right it it's um when actually no it was probably just luck right because you have no idea you have no way of actually um proving that what you did was responsible for the outcome um and so i'm just absolutely Right. right. So I'm just I'm just trying to think of a good example for this. So I think we'll we'll probably end on this point. And <laughs> I love how we've got through two bullets. Um, but this is such so much fun. And <laughs> we'll, we'll have to book the, the another another podcast of the rest. Um, but I finished on this point, and that's I just want to illustrate what we're talking about again in the context of a personal training business, since obviously those are most of the people that listen to the show. Is you know, let's say Using your using your example of a small sample size. So typically, Dave, and you you, you know this obviously being a personal trainer in your past is mm. the um the 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 kind of like um uh, lead generation sales process for a hit business is you know generate a free introductory workout for example. Someone comes in, um, someone comes in for their free workout, and then they go through uh, you know a bit of a consultation. It's like a set sales process that that company should have in place, right? And then they yeah. will, at the end of the end of the free workout, they will have, you know, they'll ask for the sale and they'll even convert that prospect into a customer or not. Um, and so I'm just curious how you might apply this thinking to that. Is it is it that, you know, you couldn't necessarily look at, let's say, um, one week's worth of consultations. Let's say you've got a small sample size of, say, 10 free workouts and you're, you're trying to pinpoint, you know, the factors that are driving conversions and you're looking at those that converted versus those that didn't and you're trying to draw draw cause and effect from the process that's probably going to be difficult to do over just one week whereas if you did it over three months or six months and you looked at you know hundreds of free workouts and maybe you've got a um you're more likely to see cause and effect but there's still probably an element of guesswork there as well even in the even in that case because it's not you know it's it's not like a perfect scientific experiment. So I don't know if that's a good example, but I just thought I'd bring that to the table. It, it's a, yeah, I think it's a great example and, and very relevant for your readers, for your listeners, of course, that, yeah, you know, and people do, though. They, you know, they'll often, you know, and, and when it's your living, you're going to worry. If you don't get any conversions that week, you're going to start saying to yourself, what on earth have I done wrong? But the truth is you might have done nothing wrong because the next week or the next month, you might get twice as many as normal and you're back to your average. You know, the data is aren't distributed evenly. And that's why, for example, you get a lot of, you know, people concerned about things like, you know, when there's, um, you know, um, concerns about uh, things like, in the US, clusters of cancer around areas where there's electricity pylons. Well, the, the truth is there are bound to be these kind of clusters because clustering of data is a simple fact of life. They don't all distribute evenly, but it, but it doesn't necessarily tell you a story. That's just statistics. That's how they work. <laughs> it's just giving me so much stuff to think about. It's been so valuable, Dave. I really appreciate it. There's a couple of things going on in my life right now where this is very, very relevant. Um, look, I'm just I'm just uh, conscious of time, and um, so I'm going to need to obviously wrap things up there and then book a book another podcast together. Um, but just to obviously just wrap this one up, what's the best way for people to find out more about you and contact you, Dave? Well, I'm always more than happy for people to email me or or normally call me in the office, but I'm not not back uh, much in the office yet because of COVID. <laughs> of but they can email me at 
They can email me at d.d.smith at mmu.ac.uk. And as you know, Lawrence, I'm a bit old school. I'm not really into social media, but I am on LinkedIn and you're more than welcome to reach out on that. Great. Thank you for that. Um, And for everyone listening to find the blog post for this episode, please go to highintensitybusiness.com and search for episode 314, where you'll find the rest of the series uh, on decision making. And and obviously, there'll soon be a part four for the three parts we've done already. Um, And until next time, thank you very much for listening. Thank you.